Thank you for all being here to share this with me. I want to thank June and Robert for inviting me to speak about this Cheyenne River Reservation Retreat, which I went to, I believe it was July. First, I'm going to tell you about the total feeling that I had when I came back about my experience, which was the deep compassion, patience, endurance, and hope of the Lakota people. In spite of all the difficulties they've had over the years. And then I'm going to tell you how it went about, what, how it was organized, what we did. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the intention that was posted on the um, Zen, Zen Peacemakers site before the retreat started. I'll just read that. It is our deep intention and prayer that this Bearing Witness retreat plays its own small part in the process of healing and that we realize our wholeness amongst ourselves, the earth, native peoples, and the earth itself. So this is the second retreat that happened. Um, The first one was last year, which was much larger. And June and Robert, Paul and Julie all attended. And I've asked them to say a few things about it, perhaps in the middle. It was a very large retreat. This one was much smaller. There were 24 people from the East Coast, the Midwest, California. And it was organized by Genro Gaunt, who is my Zen teacher from New York. He's been going down to the Lakota tribes for about 15 years to familiarize himself with their situation and to gain trust by the tribes in in Genro's attempts at having the retreats. So he's very familiar with the workings of how their lives go on. And We first started out, um, the woman who drove us there, Irene Edelman, I met her in New York at the uh, Hudson River Retreat, and she said she was going to drive, so she had this Cherokee Jeep, and actually she drove six... (laughs) See? Appropriate. (laughs) 6,000 miles in 10 days. Um, She was really, and she was, you know, I'm doing this myself. We asked to help her drive. She said, no, I'm fine. I can do this. It was a new car, so she probably felt a little nervous Mm -hmm. about other drivers. But anyway, she did the the whole trip. And um, she picked me up in Chicago. uh, I guess it was at 5 in the morning with two other travelers, Mariola from Poland, who I met during the Auschwitz retreat, and her new husband, Godfried from Belgium. Uh, I found a place for them to stay at a fellow Zen, Zen's apartment in Hyde Park. So we, we all went together in the van, truck, Cherokee, Jeep. And we drove to Rapid City. We stayed in Rapid City. It took us about 14 hours. We stayed there overnight. And then we went to a kind of gathering of all the participants in Rapid City at a campsite, which was like a sheltered patio where you know we had our picnic and people introduced themselves and said their intentions, why they were there, what had brought them there. And you know, it was just amazing to get to know these people and share from the hearts as to why they were there. Charmaine Whiteface was there, Tuffy was there, these women had been in last year's retreat, and they talked about how happy they were to have us there. Um, The gratitude that I felt from our participation was just amazing. And despite the fact that I didn't know anything about what I was going to see or experience, I felt very welcomed. Um, So after we had this picnic... Uh, Tioka-san said, well, there's several things we can do for five days. We can go um, build houses for, the, for some of the Indian people who didn't have homes, who were living in trailers, 
or we could go see the Mustang and Burrow um, Reservation, or we could go down to Bear Butte and climb the mountain. There was just a whole series of things that were involved. But he couldn't say exactly what we would do because everything was in a process of transition. There was never any really set um, who could meet at what time, when and where, because all these people had to be organized. So the first day we did drive to Eagle Butte, which was a camping site where we camped out one night, and everybody set up all their t everybody had their tents and sleeping bags, and we brought you know food and we cooked at night and got to know each other and had a very low key first night there. And after that, we drove a little ways to Bear Butte, which was a butte. I didn't know what the definition was until I went there. It's kind of like a mountain. Does anyone know what a butte is? Okay. It, Bear Butte was 4,036, 4,000 feet high. And a lot of the participants in the camp climbed it because this was a sacred place for the Indians. They usually would go to the top of the mountain when they had to decide about some very serious council that was going on within the tribes. I didn't climb the entire uh, length of the mountain. It was a bit too much for me, but many of the people did. And it was very steep. You know, I started off, I did maybe less than a third. And as, as we climbed higher and higher, the road got narrower and higher. And there were signs for beware of rattlesnakes <laughs> and things like this, you know. But they said, they always give you a warning sign. You know, that's why they have the rattle, so just <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> Nobody had that experience of encountering a rattlesnake. We did find a bunny on our way down. <laughs> so we did kinhin with the bunny. It was called bunny kinhin. Because the bunny was in front of us, and we would walk very slowly as the bunny led us down the little path. Um, and many of the participants, of course, did get to the top, and they said it was extraordinary view. And along the way... There were trees, of course, along the butte, and there were um, what they called prayer bundles, which were a red, gold, and black um, little like bundles of tobacco that the Indians had placed along the way, giving homage to whoever and whatever cause they wanted to pray for as they were going up there. They were quite beautiful. So then... Um, that night we had, you know, the weather was fine, we slept well, we got up the next day, and um, Teokasin, who was actually the musician for this music, said, well, we, you have a choice today. We can go to the Simply Smiles Center, where um, people are organizing for youth to have them involved in various projects of art and growing food and teaching them skills to be more self-independent. And we could also go and help people build homes, which was kind of like um, Project for Humanity. And they build two homes a year for the Indians. And um, you know, people just broke off into different sections as to where they wanted to go. So I chose to go to the um, building of homes. and. I think there's, this is one of the slides of a house that's being built. I think it took three months in the summer, through the summer, spring and summer, to finish building. Can we go to the next one? Um, and uh, the children and the adults who were organizing the children from Simply Smiles went to this site, and there were many men and women who were very... Um, knowledgeable in plumbing and building and, you know, doing all kinds of household skills that you need to put up a house. It was a very simple house. Um, there I am painting. I asked him if I could paint something. So, um, and then, then there's other ones after that. People were doing scraping off um, plaster from the floor, putting up windows, just anything that needed to be done. And we were there for um, the good part of a morning, working with the youth 
One of the things I learned about that environment in the summer is that it can get as hot as 120 degrees. So they had to build the walls like umpteen inches thick, and they had this new uh, procedure that they learned from building in Boston to, against the cold, that the concrete walls were especially thick, and they were, that's what they put up in these homes. So they would hold the heat in the winter when it could go down to 20 below zero and keep in the cool with a small air conditioner during um, 120 degrees in the summertime. Um, I actually met a man who was going to be living in one of the homes we were building, and he was just so thrilled about it. You know, a very, a guy who had been to Vietnam, I think he said three times. He was about a, a mid-60s. Um, a lot of smoking, a lot of people smoke out there because, I guess, because of the lack of um, easily accessible food sources, People choose to smoke rather than, you know, eating, which, which sounds really very, very sad. Anyway, he was happy about this home, and he, he probably has moved in by now. So after that, um, we had the opportunity to go to the Missouri River and go for a swim. It was a very hot day, so some of us did go swimming. Um, and... Uh, the Missouri River, as you probably know from Standing Rock Reservation, what's going on there, is an incredibly beautiful body of water, very clean, and it was just delicious to swim in, in that heat. This is a, a slide of the, um, garden. the Garden La Plante, um, which was near Simply Smiles Center where the children could go for learning various skills. And they're trying to grow their own food now because although the Indians have been allowed to live on, this, on their land, um, a lot of the um, ranchers and heavy uh, corporations or companies own the land, so they have to lease it from them. And they can't really grow a lot of food there. So they're having to start small parcels of land to grow their own and, and become more self-sufficient. The other shocking thing I learned was that in order to get to a grocery store that was owned by the, it was called the Lakota Market, we had to drive 45 minutes from La Plante and other cities, other nearby towns, to get to, the, to this grocery store. So... Everyone has to have a car, and, you know, to go 45 minutes, how often? I mean, I go, you know, I try to go every day grocery shopping, but these people have to travel such long distances and um, to nourish themselves. Um, the other thing that I learned was that right now, this period of time is called the seventh generation the seventh generation after Wounded Knee. And when wound, Wounded Knee happened, one of the chief warriors said that our, our heritage has been broken, the cord of our unity has been broken, and it's going to take seven generations before it begins to heal. So this is like the time right now. This is when it's, it was um, advised that this could happen now. And as you will see, Yes, you had a question, Mark? I'm just really, really touched by the emotion of, of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, because you were in the middle of it, were you having circle around all of these things as well? We did have circle a few times during the evenings, yes. To sort of process. process. Yes, to yeah. process what was going on and to you know, reconnect with each other. We did that several times, and... Um, near the end, we had a very large circle with the people from Simply Smiles, with the youth, and we talked about our experience there. So it was, you know, we were being, we were being very held in a safe container with Genro and Tioka-san and many of the other elders who were there. As I was saying about the, um, the seventh generation, so the hope is there that 
that they can heal, that they will heal. And organizations like Simply Smiles, and then there was another <clears throat> Cheyenne Youth Help Group, which started in, I believe it was, Bear Butte. It was an organization that's been going for 20 years. It's funded by the government, surprisingly, and probably other private donors. And there is like a beautiful brand new center for youth to do art, to do computers. They have a gym there. There's even a restaurant that is serviced by the youth. We had lunch there, and the food was delicious. Um, they were supposed to have buffalo burgers, but they didn't have them that day. But they did have them the following day, and I heard they were really yummy. Um, so that's going on. And also in that center, Julie Garrow is running it. And if you ever want to look it up, you could check it online, Google Cheyenne Youth River um, Organization. And she has a store there where the youth can sell their art projects. The other thing I learned from Teokasan was that the uh, Cheyenne do not have a word for art. And because it's such an integral part of their life, it's not separated like it is here. It's not something you do in addition to whatever else. It's just part of, part of their experience. And the other word that they don't have is my, or um, a word about ownership my land, my house, my whatever, because everything is so communally organized and shared. So you can imagine what was taken when um, uh, the army went in and they, you know, slaughtered these people and took away their, well, their traditions were taken away, their language and, and their families. Children were taken away from their parents at the age of three. And one man I met there, Roderick, he was reunited with his mother at the age of nine. Um, there were pictures online you can see of young Indian children in these so-called missionary schools where they're in a certain kind of uniform. They couldn't wear any of their garb. And they, of course, they all look traumatized. And that's one of the other things Teokasan to told us about when we met for, at the picnic the very first day. He said, be prepared to know that you're going to see a lot of people who are experiencing trauma. And it's, it's evident in the kind of silence that some of the people um, pre pre presented and, and some of the... Um, addictions that we witnessed, and the alcoholism. This is a se severe kind of trauma that they, when you, what, what happens when you take away a language tradition and a family from a people? It's totally broken. And so there's this attempt to really reunite and form a bond with each other and also with Mother Earth. That's the other thing that was spoken about a lot with the elders was the, the fracture that Western man has experienced uh, with Mother Earth. And because of, you know, the, the Indians had this relationship with Earth that was very unified and precious and respected. And now look what's happening. It's kind of like, okay, this is the payoff, you know. We have to learn how to listen to Mother Earth is what we were told and let Mother Earth listen to us. Um, what, I think it was the last day we went to see the elder who held the, um, the peace pipe from the white buffalo. And he told us, I think he was also in his 70s, Aldhel, I think his name was Aldhelb. He said that, um, you know, we have to really learn to be respectful and to walk in silence when we're in nature. Um, one example he made about the rhythms of the Indian culture. He was talking about when a child is born, he said, we don't cut the umbilical cord immediately. We don't just, you know. There's a certain 
time that you have to wait before it's the right time to do this. So, I mean, to try and comprehend that, you know, and what it means to a people, to know about those kinds of rhythms um, is amazing, I thought. So, uh, all in all, you know, it was a, just a very emotional, beautiful learning experience about hope amidst all of this addiction and, you know, suicide rate among the teenagers is also very high. And hopefully that will be curbed or it's curbing, it's slowing down or it's, it will be stopped. I pray for that. I would like to ask Paul and Robert and Julie and June if you could say a few words about last year and your experience at that very large retreat. very large experience. Um, I think it made clear to me how <clears throat> their culture at Central was really taken away. That the kids were sent away, as Annie said, to missionary schools and they were asked to give up their language and their religion and all of their um, the accoutrements of those, um, and met some really interesting people, some of whom I knew from the Auschwitz trip, and some Native Americans. Uh, what was the whitefish, Charlotte? Charmaine Whiteface? Yeah, Charmaine Whiteface. A number of them were very... Uh, incredible in terms of their sharing. So I was very happy and I felt sad, but I was very glad that I had gone. Thank you, Paul. Julie? Um, let's see. Uh, we got to camp out, and um, me and June were in a tent that I had, and it was like uh, see-through, and we got to see the stars. And in the morning, there was a Native American flute that we get played. It was like either Tioka San or somebody else um, through the hills, and you could hear it. Um, it was like a big white tent and a lot of speakers, and we would listen. Um, pretty much almost all day to people speaking. Um, and we got to meet um, Chaz. She's like an uh, amazing Lakota woman. Um, she has a dog and she um, came to talk here. Uh, and I, um, I think the Bearing Witness Retreat was uh, very meaningful for me to go. Like it meant something to me to go there. <clears throat> and um, it was also pretty uncomfortable um, some of the time um, to hear about that stuff, but uh, but I, I appreciate it, and the um, and I'm still working on the loving action part because it's like um, uh, you practice not knowing, bearing witness, and then loving action, and so I'm still doing different loving action things. 
Now, um, and I'm practicing not knowing, um, like I was practicing yesterday, um, when I was driving, coming up to a stop sign, and then kind of waiting and feeling with my body to see what I should do next. And it's uh, challenging. Or with groups of people, when I walk up to different groups of people or individuals, like to practice not knowing and kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. Like when people want to hug me or something like that. Um, and but that it's really a really nice thing to do if you have a chance to go to a bearing witness retreat. Thanks, Julie. Robert. It's so hard to talk about it an experience that was so overwhelming. I am thinking of a, a dinner, I, I believe it was like the second or third evening I was there. I, um, I found a, an empty table, but people were milling around, and so as I was sitting down, a, a little boy, maybe about five years old, came and sat down, and his mother came, and then a little later, the husband came and sat down. So here I was having dinner with people I didn't know, and I was very much aware of, for a lack of better term, a cultural divide uh, at, at this table. And it was, it was okay. Um, the the boy was cute and inter interactive, and and so I began to talk to the mother and found out that she worked. Uh, she worked for, I believe, an organization that was trying to clear some of the the, uh, the mines, the uranium mines, is that mm -hmm. right, that they have there mm -hmm. that are causing so much problem. So I, I talked with her for a little bit. Her husband uh, was not into communication. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that's all right. I respect that. So. It was an experience that I found meaningful in my own way, and that confronting that uh, a barrier. But it, it is not a barrier. It was just something to to sit with and to move in small steps. I guess. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things I noticed was, um, <clears throat> you know, we ha all have a lot of conceptions about Native peoples, you know, that I, I do still, but they're really people, and that's <laughs> what I, you know, got closer to, they're people. And they're a beautiful people, just really warm and uh, grounded and uh, not so complicated, although they're in complicated situations. And one thing I remember, you know, I, um, I was very grateful for my um, ability, I mean, my um, Hawaiian cultural heritage. And uh, so... Um, Genro asked me if I would, you know, do a hula. So I said, sure, I would be happy to share that. And so I, um, <clears throat> I did a, I couldn't get, there's no um, wireless there. It's like, great, no wireless. <laughs> and then at the same time, it's like, oh, no music, because it was all from my iPhone, <laughs> right? No music. Okay, so well, I can sing. So I sang, and uh, a beautiful song written by um, a woman who is um, in another in another battle on the Big Island, and trying to keep the huge mountain, the sacred Mauna Kea, from one more huge telescope uh, d development. So she wrote the song about being strong 
And so I shared it. I was really happy to share it. And after that, the women were so friendly to me. It was like, you know, I went out to, to, there was a beautiful fire that they kept going throughout the whole um, camp. You had, there were people watching it 24 hours. It was to keep the heart and intention of the event going. So I went out there, you know, at the end of the day, and the women were so nice. Oh, June, come on here. Come have a blanket. Have a blanket, you know, because it was kind of chilly out there. And so they, I was like, oh, thank you. That's so nice. Sure. They were just uh, very warm and very appreciative of whatever people shared uh, with their hearts. They are very appreciative. Uh, so what a beautiful people they are. And that's what I... I think I really learned there, in addition to all the trauma that has uh, happened to them. Thank you, June. I, I thought of a couple of things I wanted to mention. One is that we didn't have um, fires at night, but we did have horseback riding. And Byron Buffalo has about six or eight horses on this uh, little area in Bridges, South Dakota. And he asked if anybody wanted to go horseback riding for $15. <laughs> so we said, sure. So I signed up. I gave him my money. And everybody, there was like 24 of us, it seemed like everybody wanted to ride a horse. And it was super hot. It was like 100 degrees. And I looked at these horses. I thought, oh, my God, how are they going to make it? Well, finally, about two hours later, I was one of the last people to get on a horse. I was a little nervous because I hadn't been on a horse in about 20 years. I got one of the old ones, and uh, he, he was real tired and slow. So I had about a five-minute ride, and uh, then we went back into the shelter and stuck our heads under water. It was just really, really refreshing. And the last thing I want to report about is that there was a <clears throat> Mustang and Burrow reservation um, run by a woman named Susan Weissman, I think is her name. You can look that up online as well. I might have her last name wrong, but she is, how would you say it? She has bought 500 Mustangs and the land to keep them grazing. Um, she's been doing this for umpteen years, and she took us into her home, and she told us the story, um, which you can also find online. I had a brochure, but I left this morning early, and I forgot it. These horses are just incredibly beautiful. They were all grazing outside, wild, no, no gate or anything around there. And she said, we will go out there later and we will be with them. And she told us how to act, you know, like don't surround them. Don't, you know, get them in a situation where they feel they're penned in and just walk slowly in the middle. So we did that. And it was an incredible experience to be in the midst of these wild animals who were so loving um, also, she asked for donations because it takes something like $1,000 a day to feed these animals. They cannot graze on the land because of ranchers owning it, and so they have, they have a set sector of land where they can graze, and the rest of the food has to be brought in, so they have to bring in the hay to feed the horses. 1000 bucks a day for 500 and um, she goes to Congress, and she pleads their case, and she talks about them, and, you know, and how important it is that we keep them. A lot of these animals have been killed by ranchers who weren't rescued by her. Um, that was a really special excursion we took. And the last thing I'll say is that there was a terrific storm one night. It was like a squall. You know, Tiogerson said, get ready, there's going to be a rainstorm. So all of a sudden it comes down like, you know, Noah's Ark. I mean, it was just incredible. I ran in my tent, 
And I had like a candy bar there, and I thought, okay, I'll be all right. <laughs> and it just came down in like just incredibly rushing, rushing waters. Soon, I noticed that the bottom of my tent felt like a waterbed. You know, it was like, it was like moving up and down, and I could see my sleeping bag was getting wet. So I stuck my head out, and I, I met Mariola and Gottfried in the other tent, and I said, help. So Gottfried got a, a shovel, and he started going around the tents making little canals so the water could go down these canals. And... Um, Eventually it stopped and we got out and everybody had to take their tent out. No matter how big or fancy or new the tent was, they all got soaked. We turned them upside down and that night uh, they were dry and we were able to sleep silently. Uh, that's it. Uh, any questions? Paul. Um, I'm Get it down, so. You have to stand up, Paul. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I've been getting emails from the uh, Zen peacemakers about the trip, and it seems to me that some of the people are at Standing Rock. Is that correct? Yes, I think so. I don't. Um, I'm ignorant about who is there, but I I think there are some people there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually there is Balaz uh, Davus who was on the retreat with us. He was there and reporting. Chaz there. And Chaz is there, yeah. People are getting arrested, unfortunately, and there are dogs and guns there. And I saw Igyoku Roshi from the Zen Center of Los Angeles was there. She's the abbot of our mother temple. She was also there. Yes, Mark. So let's go back to your intention. You'll have to. Yes. I can okay. be heard, I'm okay. sure. Let's go back to your intention. Would you talk about your intention in going? My intention is in going was to learn about the people, to learn about their situation, and <laughs> to bear witness, um, to try and be as open as possible to all the feelings that came up and to have loving kindness. And whatever that means for me, you know, when I went to Simply Smiles, I thought, yeah, maybe I'll come back here next year and volunteer. They need an art instructor. Maybe I could help them out. So these are ideas that I'm playing with now. Okay, thank you everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.